the, the outline for this evening is really to do a little introduction bit, which I'll do now. We're going to do a quick revision of our anatomy, uh, and, uh, and I've emphasised a few key things to try and help us get familiar with what's going on with the pelvis, some of the key ligamentous uh, structures, some of the key nerve supplies, the fascial organisation, um, so that we can get a good 3D picture of what it is that we're putting our hands on, um, so we can get an idea. And then um, I'm going to introduce a screening routine, which um, my fourth year students who are here will all know, because those who've come into the Women's Health Clinic already, they will uh, uh, I'm going to talk about how this has evolved, because it's been an interesting process in itself. And then um, we will then look at some techniques, or at least principles of techniques. Um, I'm not a great believer, particularly when it comes to visceral, in specific techniques. So I don't have many specific techniques for the liver or specific techniques for the roots of the mesentery or for uh, the bladder. I have some holes that I use, but it's not particularly formulaic uh, other than applying the principles. And so if we can cover the principles, then I think anyone um, who's prepared to try and listen to their hands and trust their hands can uh, make a difference to these um, structures. So uh, when we look at osteopathy, when you go to the WHO uh, document on osteopathy, we see the five models. Now, obviously, all the students and recent graduates will be you know, very familiar with these, but some of us who are a bit longer in the tooth may not have seen these official models of definition of osteopathy, and, and I think they're really good, actually. Uh, and the whole document, the WHO, it's very easy to download. If you put WHO, osteopathic principles, you'll find there's a 35-page document, PDF, which you can download, which talks about the outline, that the, the basic minimum there should be in all osteopathic courses uh, throughout the world. And it's a sort of a benchmarking standard. And it's a really good document, really, really well done. And I think it really um, shows that there is a bit more thought than sometimes we think there is behind you know, the, uh, what it takes to be an osteopath. And they've really clearly looked at some of the principles. So very quickly, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at these, but uh, number one, the biomechanical structure function model. This is probably the one that you know, is the one that lives in our head most of the time. You know, patients come in, sore back, and we decide, oh, there's a bit of facet dysfunction. I know that's not very fashionable these days, and it's important to talk about, you know, what the pain means to the patient and the context of it, and if we're nice to the patient, they'll get better more quickly, and the fact that we're touching them is beneficial. But there is clearly, I think most osteopaths believe there is a biomechanical element to that as well, that we are in some way influencing. Perhaps not the way that um, we thought we were, but there is some kind of biomechanical change. Clearly, a joint did move, uh, uh, it no longer does because it's dysfunctional, and the basic osteopathic idea is that we can make it move again, and so reverse that somatic dysfunction, and so that's the biomechanical model. This idea that, you know, stuff, uh, we, we have some kind of impact. And then there's a respiratory circulatory uh, structure function model, and this idea that um, you know, this is again, rule of the artery, you know, you know, it's all basic there, I get all that idea. But very few of us, well, no, no, that's not true, because you may all do it, but I certainly spent much of my career, sort of early career, ignoring these principles, really, and not uh, giving lip, lip service to them, doing the odd foot pump and a little bit of trying to sort of improve circulation and, uh, 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 and uh, venous stasis. But in reality, I wasn't really... Um, uh, working on this, and there's a very good work that's been done by the Americans on this, Zeke and others, uh, which we have a whole another presentation on, which we do another time. But uh, but there is a really good model behind that, and we're going to look at some of um, that model as part of uh, the Women's Health Management tonight. Um, the neurological structure function model, and again, this is really about this adaptation of reflexes. This idea that you know when we you make an adjustment to make a simple thing, this idea of you make an adjustment at a joint, that somehow you alter the neural reflex locally and that elicits muscle relaxation, maybe have more distant effects through the autonomic nervous system. And then also all this idea of osteopathic centers, the idea that you know bits of the spine correspond to different organs, that's all an, a neurological effect, that's all taking advantage of the neurological effects. So if someone has a stomach ulcer or something like that and you think well if I was wanting to help them uh, osteopathically I might directly manipulate around there uh, around the stomach but I would also look to the nerve supply to try and calm that down to try and break that autonomic loop that's going on so that's the idea of the neurological structure function model but also it's behind the idea that when we manipulate organs um, and this is uh, an idea that Baral really pushes forward in, in his books 
is the idea that not that we necessarily are mobilizing an immobile organ, but by when we do mobilize, yes, we influence circulation, but two, we are also creating a change in the reflexes around, because we think of the nervous system that uh, 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 goes to the gut, it's, it's as complex almost as the brain, and, uh, and so there's huge amounts of receptors in there that we alter when we put our hands on and we touch the abdomen. And the moment we place our hands on in a way that is sympathetic and non-pain causing, and in an attempt to restore normal mobility, you're gonna have huge neural effects. And so that's this idea of, uh, again, one of the uh, models of osteopathy. And then the biopsychosocial model is, is setting the context, and so it's understanding. And we all probably subconsciously do this. When we look at our patients, we all know, because of their understanding, you know, some will come in and you're still having the argument, oh, something's gone out and we're back, I just need you to put it back. And actually, it's a waste of time trying to tell them, well, actually, it's not that, because in their head, it's out of place, I just need you to whack it and get it back in place, and then I'll be happy. And until you do that, if you don't do that for them, then they'll go to someone who will, and that's sort of setting it in context for them. And, and, and yes, you can educate them toward understanding and having a more accurate idea about what's wrong with them, if, if that's appropriate. But for some people, you can't do that, and so you have to work with the model that they have and the beliefs that they have. And yes, we're all about trying to break down uh, inaccurate beliefs so that our patients have a better prognosis, so that they don't believe something is out and so therefore until it's back in that they can't function normally again you know that's a very damaging idea to have so we do try and work to overcome that but we also have to work within the constraints that we have and their background and so all of those things and then there's a bioenergetic structure function model it's this idea that you know the body will always try and do what is most efficient but you know if you're uh, walking around with a broken ankle in a cast, where you don't be walking around, but you're hobbling around on crutches. We all know that that's enormously knackering and exhausting, and you're working and a lot of energy to do that. And then you come out of the off the crutches and you start to try and walk, and of course it doesn't work so well. It hurts, and you develop that as a pattern. And if we don't get in and change that, that's going to alter energy uh, usage in that patient. They're going to be inefficient in the way they use. So those are the, the those are the models that we're looking at within. Uh, the osteopathic uh, model overall. And I suppose if we were to look at uh, where did women's health fit into that, uh, I would say probably at least, the first, well probably all of them, but certainly very much in the first three, I think there's a huge effect in those first three models that we're trying to work with. And for me particularly, what's really changed about my work in the last few years is really recognizing and understanding the role of the respiratory circulatory model. The fact that there are vast amounts of blood, fluid within the body, that needs to move and it needs to not stay static. And because when it does, that breeds ill health, and particularly for women who are having uh, pelvic problems of any kind, always there will be stasis of some sort that is uh, causing that, and for me that's a very important um, area to, to uh, address. So I guess the next question is, sorry, I'm the other way myself, um, why is there a need for osteopathy in women's health? You know, is there a need? And I've analyzed some of the reasons why I, I, I think that's there is a room. Uh, there is room for us, uh, and I think probably a quite an important role for us. Um, I mean, first of all, we're just really rubbish in this country at looking after women. We're just uh, hopeless at it. Uh, we, we we do a really bad job of uh, uh, chronic pain uh, for women who are suffering after childbirth, uh, for women who are going through menopause, for women with stress and continence. You know, we're just the, the, the service is disjointed, uh, it's unsatisfactory, there's very poor explanation, uh, and so women, uh, as some of my, one of my um, patients said to me, you know, it's, it's really, the, the, the only time we talk about it is when I'm out at lunch with my girlfriends, you know, that's when we talk about these issues, because, you know, my doctor hasn't got time, isn't particularly interested, and um, this says, well, you know, it's normal you've had kids, and that's sort of the approach. Uh, you know, one of my patients uh, who was told by a female doctor, and I know I've shared this with the group before, but it still scars me to this day, to, you know, another health professional would say this to a woman, you know, she was suffering with this paranoia, she, you know, she had a baby, she couldn't, you know, she and her husband weren't able to have sex because she was in too much pain, and her female GP said to her, well, love, you know, inebriation and lubrication are really the key, and that was kind of her answer to uh, how to deal with this very distressing, very real, profoundly difficult problem and it's just 
deeply offensive that that sort of still goes on, and it's not just male practitioners that are doing this. It's you know, it's 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 just a general attitude. And if we compare the UK approach and actually quite a lot of Northern Europe, Denmark are not very good. You know, Denmark who are supposed to be held up as this wonderful nation and you know happiest place on earth to live, but they are crap at dealing with women's health issues as well. I've got colleagues over there and we've talked about, you know, how, how, how they, they have a very similar approach to us, which is that the only time a woman in this country is ever examined gynecologically is she goes to the practice nurse, because GPs tend not to do smear tests anymore, uh, so they'll go to the practice nurse uh, uh, for a smear every three years, and we learn that some 40% uh, of women don't go because of embarrassment and nervousness about that. So, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's a real problem. And when women go to gynaecologists, they might have to wait a long time to see one, and they do go and see one, and they don't actually examine them physically. They don't actually do a physical evaluation. Uh, and so women in this country are not used to being examined physically uh, with a, a, a full gynaecological examination. You contrast that with the States, which goes in the completely opposite direction, which is where, you know, from the age of 18, you'll be given, you know, your family doctor or your gynaecologist, you'll have a specialist, you'll go and see them every year, you'll have your... Uh, internal exam every year or with a breast exam that will be done every year for the whole of your adult life. Same in France. Every every woman in France will have a gynaecologist. She shouldn't go to a GP, she goes to a gynaecologist and they'll all have a relationship with their gynaecologist and that's just normal. Uh, and and so there are cultural differences. So there are cultural challenges. That's the that's the environment in which we find ourselves. Um, but we are like so many things um, uh, at an advantage because we have time with our patients where we can educate. We don't have to jump all over and say, right, you've got all these problems, I know how to deal with that, I can do an examination for that. We can just use the time that we already have to, uh, uh, to inform and guide our patients, either in the direction of referral or in the direction of what language to use with their GP to ensure they get the right services. So even if we don't feel we're the ones who can do that examination and not everyone will necessarily be in a position to do so or feel comfortable doing that, and that's completely fine. But you could be aware of others who are prepared to examine. You know, the largest amount of my caseload that I see where I'm uh, 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 treating women gynecologically using internal technique will be where they've been referred by colleagues. It's kind of said, I'm not really, you know, I don't do that, but Michael does, so go and see Michael will do something, I'm not quite sure what, but you should feel better. And that's sort of what happens, that's how the, and so that, that's perfectly fine, um, but it's also fine for you to be able to train and get those skills as well if you want to. But there are plenty of other ways in which we can work without having to use um, those approaches. So there is a need because we're bad at looking after women and supporting them, we don't examine women well, and many problems that women experience will respond to osteopathy. Many of these chronic functional problems, they're not always a clear pathology. Obviously, there are some very nasty pathologies that we need to be aware of. So it's not a question of just treating every person that comes in with uh, you know, a, 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 a chronic pelvic pain or period pain or sudden changes um, without some kind of medical evaluation. But most of my patients I see will have been medically evaluated and told, well, yeah, there's not much we can do, or you can take this therapy, we can have that surgery, and they're kind of like, oh, yeah, I don't know that I want to do that. Is there anything else? And they know that they're not going, to, you know, they haven't got cancer, we have, all of that's been screened for. So that's when we as osteopaths can certainly step in and, and work. And you know, bear in mind that pelvic contents, they are soft tissue, and so they are amenable to manipulation. And it, again, it doesn't have to be in the way that, that you might be thinking. We can use lots of external work as well. So. That's why I think there is a need. And you know, who's doing this work? There are a few osteopaths uh, who've gone down the women's health pathway, which Renzo's put together. Um, uh, I don't think it's entirely satisfactory. I think it's a start, but I think that you know, we just haven't, you know, we really hardly got any. You think about, say, 30 years ago when osteopathy for children was first starting, when cranial osteopathy, maybe 40 years ago, when cranial osteopathy was first being introduced to the UK back in the 70s. And that's when the idea of osteopathy in children was just growing and this idea, and, it, and it's taken, you know, I've been in practice 25 years, I suppose, and, and getting on for, and, uh, and I've seen a huge change where it's sort of pretty, considered pretty normal by lots of parents to take their kids to go and see. Well, we, we sort of need the same thing to happen, I think, with women's health as well, in my view. I think that we, we, we could do the same thing and we could play a, a role. Now, there are a few specialist physios out there uh, 
who are doing this work, uh, slightly differently to the way we would do it, but, but very well in many cases, and there is actually some quite good research which they're producing, which shows there is real effect and real benefit. So there is an evidence base, but they're the only ones providing it, unfortunately. It would be nice if we were, but we, you know, we haven't got our, 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 you know, I sort of hope with the UCO sort of getting university status that they can start pushing forward with PhD programs. You know, my vision would be, you know, maybe when I retire, if ever I do one day, that, you know, in places like the ESO and BCom and others will all have PhD ships where they, you know, will have a department of paediatrics, they'll have a department of women's health, and they'll have professors who are in charge of that who are driving PhD students forward. So there's a place for you to go. You've done your AMOS, you've got your basic research skills, now you spend three to five years researching you know, how osteopathy can influence endometriosis. And you make use of the clinics that are already there, the infrastructure is there, and, uh, and, and you do the research there in those centres of excellence. But they're just not there yet. They're not really interested. I'm not sure that financially they're in a stable enough position to be able to do that. But that would be my vision for it, that we provide it through the main uh, osteopathic educational institutions. In the meantime, it's sort of more ad hoc, you know, talks like this introduce the idea and then maybe you sign up for... Well, at the moment, there is only one pathway through it with the, the, the sort of recognised profession wide. So um, we, you know, we need to we need to work on that. But anyway, so I digress. So um, I had the really nice challenge. This is what Claire asked me to talk about. Is what is, is what we're um, doing at the ESO at the moment is that we have got a women's health clinic. Uh, it's very small. Um, it is uh, it is you know small beginnings and all that. And the way it was set up, I was just sort of said, well, Michael, would you like to, you know, run a women's health clinic? I said, oh, yeah, that'd be nice. We had no idea of really what to do or no infrastructure. And uh, we very quickly realised that um, uh, it wasn't going to be as simple as that. First of all, it was scheduled um, that the third years would come in on, on that evening. So I realised I wasn't going to be able to make use of those students because they've just literally come into clinic in third year. And these are advanced, so you know there wasn't a huge amount of left hand talking to right hand. So the usual kind of issues that the that, 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 so the, the the answer to that was that uh, I was told, well, if you want to have fourth years in there, you're going to have to get them to volunteer, thinking that would kill it dead. So I said, well, okay, let's just put it out, and the whole year suddenly filled up, and we had all these lovely students coming in for an extra night that wasn't going to count toward their normal clinic hours. Uh, they weren't going to get evaluated in the same way, but they could still come along and do an extra evening. And they did it, and it was amazing. And, and, and it was lovely working with them because they want to be there. They want to be there to learn, they want to be there to work, and we've had some amazing cases over the years, and it's been really, really interesting. And I sort of then had the challenge at the beginning of thinking, okay, I'm going to have these students for six weeks. I've got to, at the end of six weeks, get them so that they can actually approach these cases that they feel that it's been worthwhile and coming in on an extra night in clinic when they could have been doing other things. Uh, what do I do with them? How do I, how do, uh, and so I realised I had no, uh, no protocols of any sort, because although I did the course with Renzo, he doesn't teach protocols per se, he teaches principles and he shows you lots of techniques and other things, but there's no, okay, this is your grand examination, this is what you do, and one of the things I've been trying to develop for years really is, uh, just because of how my brain works, is a, is a simple general screening program for the whole body that can integrate cranial, structural and visceral all within a meaningful time that you can still have time in a half hour slot to examine and do a treatment. And, um, and so, you know, necessity is, uh, is what drives invention, isn't that what they say? Necessity is the mother of invention? Well, suddenly I was going to be presented with these students and I sat down and thought, right, let's work out some of the basic principles and I'm going to show you that routine that I came up with and it has been adapted a little bit over the year. Uh, my students have taught me and, you know, put in some other ideas. It's been really, really a nice process. But, you know, these are the challenges setting up the clinic is that, you know, there's a lack of education and awareness amongst the patient population. Uh, although there are absolutely tons of patients in the ESO clinic who are coming already who would benefit, but it's getting that, uh, the challenge of having them come into a, a different clinic on an evening that they may not be available, um, getting student awareness of what we can deal with, getting receptionist awareness, getting a specific, I mean, I can't tell you, the nightmare it's been just trying to sort it all out. But it's amazing that it has worked and we've had a few uh, really lovely, lovely cases. Now I want to share just one example uh, uh, last year, I, I, I helped uh, one of uh, uh, now fourth years. She's about to graduate. Em Emily, uh, she's a French student. She joined the ESO in her 
third year, beginning of the third year, having trained for the first two years in France. So she came with quite a good visceral background, and she wanted to test Baral's model for um, uh, dysmenorrhea. She wanted, he, he, he had a little model for, for doing dysmenorrhea. She said, well, I, you know, she said, before we set up the women's health clinic properly, she came to me and said, "Well, look, you know, would you would you help?" I said, "Yeah, sure." We came up with a little protocol, and um, she had a few patients, and we applied the protocol, and she'd found this uh, period pain tracking app that uh, was validated and was seen as a means that you know it would remind you every day to put in the uh, data as to how you were feeling, your pain levels, and all of that sort of thing. And uh, of those patients in the study, two thirds experienced very significant reduction in their symptoms. Uh, just using a very specific cr uh, criteria from Baral. It was a bit constraining because I could only work on those steps that we'd agreed. I was like, well, I really want to do this, I really want to do that, but we couldn't, so we just had to work with what was there in the books just to test um, whether, whether it had an effect. So it's a it was a very small study and you can't draw much from it except the fact that those who were treated by it were, were really benefited. So Emily was really interested and she came in, one of the first students to come into the Women's Health Clinic when we established it at the beginning of her fourth year. And um, we had a case, young woman in her mid-20s, um, she'd come in, I can't remember, some maybe like a shoulder problem or something else, and she'd been examined by Claudia Knox, who's also done the women's health course, and uh, just in general clinic, and um, as part of the abdominal exam, she found some issues and said, I think you need to go to the women's health clinic, and so referred her across. So we started questioning this, this girl and uh, you know, taking another history. And she sort of just believable period pain and digestive problems. And she'd seen every specialist under the sun. They didn't really know what to do with her. There was no real formal diagnosis, but she, she just wasn't doing very well. She was very, she, it was really dominating her life. And um, so I think I saw her two or three times in the women's health clinic and then she stayed with Emily and went into the general clinic. And I saw Emily a few weeks later and I said, oh, yeah. How's this patient getting on? She said, oh, it's really amazing. I was really hoping Emily might be here tonight because I've had her tell the story because it's really powerful hearing it from her. And she said, yeah, my patient, she just said uh, quite spontaneously uh, a, a week or two ago, she, she just said, you know, my life is completely different. I don't have this pain anymore. She said, I have felt my whole life since my period started. Uh, that's right, she, yeah, she was getting cystitis every month. That's right, she was getting cystitis. I remember the full case now, it's all of a sudden come back to me. She's been this awful cystitis for several days, every single month. She'd been on antibiotics almost every month of her life, so, so from the age of eight. And then when her period started, it got even worse. And so she just had this dreadful, dreadful history. And she just, there was nothing really that medicine was really helping with. And here, one of our fourth year students, she wasn't even a qualified osteopath. She's very talented, very good, and really took on everything that I'd shown and, and, and did more. And she worked really well. And, and this girl responded in a way that she no longer gets cystitis. She just doesn't have that happen anymore. And she doesn't get these digestive issues. Her periods don't you know, cripple her and keep her off work anymore. And she said, I feel like a normal person. I, I've always felt different. My whole life I've felt different because she was so young when it started. And yeah, it's really tragic you know, that that's gone on that long. It's amazing that it's made a difference. But, and, 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 there were no internal techniques used, it was just purely abdominal work along with normal osteopathic work, which we're all familiar with. And it's completely changed her life, completely changed her life. And if we did it for no other reason, that would be a good enough reason, but there are other cases. Now obviously she's very dramatic, I remember that because she was particularly bad, and I remember the fact that she burst into tears and crying, you know, and how bad we felt for her and how, how she was, but this, that there, are, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of cases like hers and osteopathy can help. And osteopathy started out helping women. You know, we always learn that still never had any instruments or never, he only used his hands. It's not quite true. He had one device he did use, which was a spoon, a wooden spoon. He used it internally <laughs> to mobilize the uterus for period pain. And uh, it was, uh, it was, I know, I don't know why I shared that, I just thought it was there, one of those random facts. But you know, the, the, the osteopaths early on were dealing with women who were suffering uh, from the kind of problems that we see today. These things have been going on and osteopathy has always been interested in and we kind of forgot about it. We dismissed it, got caught up in the biomechanical model, we just fixed backs and sacroiliac pain and neck pain and all those kind of things, and forgot that we deal with some of these other things. That's how osteopathy started out. And of course, you know, there are lots of things that have come along that 
medicine is much better at dealing with than, say, having osteopathy. There are things, you know, I wouldn't go to my osteopath for cancer. You know, I just wouldn't do that. I would go along the orthodox route. Now, perhaps not everyone in the room would agree with me, but that's what I would do, and I would advise my patients to do. But there are things that we can intervene in where medicine isn't doing a great job at helping these people. They're screening for the cancers, they're screening for these diseases, but they're not really offering solid solutions for making these lives better. So that's why there's a need, that's the challenges that we have. So what, what, what are the examples of situations where I think we can intervene? And this is not exhaustive by any, any means. But I think they begin to show some of the kind of things we can have an effect on. And uh, I put in that functional fertility issues. What do I mean by that? These are the people who've been told there's nothing wrong. They've had all the tests, husband's had the sperm tests, you know, sperm counts, all okay, and yet, uh, you know, nothing, nothing's happening. Uh, and uh, that's where I think osteopathy can uh, intervene, because there are some clear mechanics and other things that need to happen. Um, incontinence, I think, is a big one. We're, we're, we're looking at that and concentrating a bit on that now and, and developing perhaps a little bit more of a protocol. I think next year, I really think we need to move that on because I think that's a huge problem. We see a huge number of patients with that. And, and I think that uh, there is some good research out there that, that we could be bringing into our practice, things, practices we can bring in, into the clinic there. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we can, we can have a difference uh, with that. Uh, and there's areas as I've talked about already. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, uh, okay, I want to talk just, just on incontinence, uh, because one of the things that, you know, obviously, we talk a lot about, or women will all have heard of either Kegel exercises or pelvic floor exercises. Uh, what we don't do in this country is check that women are actually doing these exercises properly and what should actually happen and how uh, they should move. They just kind of, it's assumed that you're doing your exercises and that's sort of about the extent of it. And again, in France, I keep coming back to this, there's a brilliant blog called, blog called My French Physio. I don't know if anyone's seen it or come across it. It's really good. And it just goes through, uh, you know, points out that, you know, women in France, when you've had a baby, you are assigned a physio who has been trained to work with you until your pelvic floor functions as they deem fit. And they sort of keep working with you and they will examine your pelvic floor and they will check that you can actually do these contractions properly, uh, whether you can contract and also when you push to see how the pelvis, uh, pelvic floor works. It's very simple and we could all do it. Uh, we, we really can. You just need to be able to have the courage to touch the perineum. You don't have to have any underwear removed. You can just get the patient and you can palpate between the ischial tuberosities. Uh, obviously get consent, all of that sort of stuff. Um, we could talk about that as well, but we're limited on time. So, but, but you do, once you can do that, can you feel the perineum rise when they do the contraction? And do you feel it bulge a little bit when they, when they uh, bear down? And there should be that basic movement. And we can do that. It's not hugely invasive. We will be grateful if you're prepared to say, obviously explain why, and you know, uh, and, and someone will say, oh, no, no, I'm doing this fine, no worries. That's fine. But for those who are like, I'm not sure, can you check? It's really not a big thing to do, and it's very straightforward and simple. But what do we tell our patients you know, to do with these exercises? I'm going to two, there are two examples that uh, really um, work, uh, I think. Um, one, uh, this was uh, work done by a physio, she did a PhD, she's practicing in London now and I can't think of her name, I should be crediting her, but I read her PhD, it was really good. And she looked at um, what cues you can give women to help them contract their pelvic floor. Because many women think you've got to contract at the front mm -hmm. and that's not going to work. If you focus on that, it simply won't work, you won't contract the right muscles. Um, it comes back to the old idea of, you know, imagine you're trying to stop yourself midstream while you're weeing and that should be the kind of uh, 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 action you should be making. It's very inefficient and you shouldn't get women to do that because it's a source of infection and, you know, we don't, we don't do that anymore. But it is, you know, that's, that's the kind of idea I've got to contract at the front. And she found that, in fact, uh, because it's levator ani which you're needing to contract, we're going to look at that in a moment, you need to contract, you can in fact focus on the anus and clench that instead and that will contract the front that you need. So she did internal ultrasound scans so you could actually see the angle of the bladder and actually see what happens when women were contracting and whether they were doing this effectively and what would make this change happen. And when they were being told to contract the posterior part of the pelvic floor, that had the greatest effect. So that was the cue. So how do you get? How do you teach someone to do that? 
Well, a lovely story, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, imagine yourself on a date, possibly not with your long-term partner, just uh, if you're just out, no, 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 you know, just, just, just for the sake of it, it's a thought experiment, okay? Just, just bear with me for a minute. Uh, so you're with someone that you're trying to impress, that you're not that relaxed in front of, so you're wanting to make sure, and you feel like, oh, I'm gonna fart. There's a big one right there. Uh, Definitely can't let that happen right here. And you're all sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, I know exactly what I do there. I clench those muscles. And as you're sitting there clenching, that is you correctly uh, activating your levator ani. And that is what a correct Kegel exercise should be. That action. It's really effective. And that's, uh, women can relate to that. And uh, it's a really good teaching tool. The other one, this is Renzo's story, it's brilliant, uh, I still like this, it works for me because I'm a little boy at heart still, and so uh, he says, you know, you imagine little boys, when they are little boys, sometimes with their friends, uh, and they want to have a little weeing contest, they go to a wall and they try to see how far up the wall they can get, you know, they, there's a, a little contraction. If you imagine yourself, just in your mind, you know, it's just a, what would I have to do to make that happen, <laughs> and you just contract, uh, and you will find that you contract the pelvic floor actually much more anteriorly. It's really effective. So if you imagine you were trying to direct your wing up a wall, what would you have to do? And this works for women too, apparently. I'm reliably informed. Uh, it's a very good visual image to be able to use, and it helps you contract the pelvic floor correctly. So those two, you can use either one, they're fine, but patients will get that, and you, you can then examine them as they make those movements and you can feel for movement of the perineum. Does the perineum ride up as they contract and then when they relax and stop doing it, does the perineum come back down? Very simple, but at least you can see whether they're doing their exercises properly. Yes? So this sort of hinges on the belief that most women have these problems because of uh, sort of lack of tone in their pelvic floor. How would you differentiate? Um, I've done a reasonable amount of reading which suggests that actually there's evidence to suggest that a hypertonic pelvic floor Absolutely, yes. can create equally if not more problems, you know, sort of certainly in cases of prolapse and things like that. So yes. um, the last thing I really want to do is send a woman away going, right, okay, well, we'll do 100 Kegel exercises every day, weighing up the wall, mm -hmm. and then she comes back sort of six months later and says, okay, yeah, they work fine, I've got a, a rectus seal or something mm -hmm. now, um, and I've got a, a hypertonic pelvic mm -hmm. floor and I can't poop either. Um, well, know. because they need to be able to do both. They need to be able to relax and contract the pelvic floor. And so they do need to still be able to, even when they're hyper to areas of hypertonicity, it's like when we use MET to uh, release a hypercontracted muscle, you're still going to contract it and then you can get a re good relaxation afterwards. And so that's where we can also guide at the point it's, it's the relaxation side. You need to be able to check. Now, obviously, if you were going to... the you're absolutely right, the general assumption is that for many women they don't know how to activate the pelvic floor and certainly a hypertonic pelvic floor can be a problem. And that is where we do have to do either some internal work or you have to be able to work on the perineal body externally or on the ischial tuberosity so you can do some work, obturator membranes, all of which we'll look at. Those are all ways, access points for the pelvic floor to make it more relaxed. So you're right, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that's why we have to do an examination. So we do need to examine, but I'm just simply giving those as a general rule for women who are kind of like, I don't want you actually to touch me, but I'm quite happy for you to give me any information. Those are some simple things to do. And you say, if that's not working you know, in terms of stress incontinence or other things, then, then um, we do need to be uh, you know, looking to e examine you if you want. You know, obviously you can go down the medical route or you can come and be seen here. Uh, so you're absolutely right, yes, hypertonic muscles are a big problem, uh, but we can teach that through relaxation as well, and we, can, we may have time to look at that as well. So, uh, yeah, so these are the conditions where we can intervene. Okay, how are we doing? So, we want to look at basic pelvic anatomy, just a quick revision <laughs> here. And what I like just about this image is it just shows, you can see, that uh, within the abdomen, higher up here, we can see uh, these adhesions here, okay? So these are showing how bowel adhesions can influence structures lower down. So there's a huge influence that comes from the abdomen. So whenever we think about trying to treat things like stress incontinence, dysmenorrhea, we have to look at the abdomen and diaphragm. We have to look at those structures because they all bear weight down on the pelvis and they all have an influence on circulation. 
and uh, we'll, we will look at perhaps how these adhesions, well, let's look at the, we see these adhesions in this picture here. How do those adhesions get formed? Just very quickly, what, what, what are the causes of those adhesions? Endometriosis. Endometriosis is certainly one, and yes, you can get them there. Typically, we often think of, bear in mind there is a fascial separation, which we're going to look at in a minute, between these pelvic organs and the abdomen. And so one of the theories, which has been shown not to be correct, but was, the idea was that uh, endometriosis was due to um, retrograde bleeding through the fallopian tubes. So the idea that the, but what they've actually found in studies is that uh, something like 90% of women have retrograde bleeding and something like 90% of women have uh, endometriosis. So um, that has been thrown out. And also because, quite rightly, you can get endometrial lesions within the general abdomen. Well, there's no direct route to get to that because you know the blood doesn't, shouldn't reach that. They're, they're two separate closed structures, and yet it does get there. So we don't really know how those cells end up there, but certainly that is one cause of adhesions. And the reason the adhesions happen is because when you bleed from those structures, which you will do each month if you have endometriosis, uh, there's fibrin in there, so anytime there's blood within the abdomen, particularly that fibrin is very sticky, and that causes uh, the surfaces that uh, where the blood is is there between the surface structures, it will cause a bind, uh, and, and and adhesions will form there. So yes, endometriosis is definitely a cause. Any other? Surgery? Yes, yeah. of any kind. And it's interesting that the the gold standard for test for endometriosis is laparoscopy. And we are introducing air into a structure in order to be able to look at it. And then when we close it up, we've left air in the area so that those surfaces dry, they stick together, and potentially can form adhesions. So um, we gently should be prepared to look at these patients pretty soon after having a laparoscopy so that we can prevent the formation. Because all you need to do is get fluid back into that area. So we do need to intervene early. We need to be incredibly gentle. I once had the opportunity to go and do a CCA exam or the equivalent of that, or FCC for the, you know, the, the, the final exam, clinical assessment, down in France at the Atman School. And um, one of the students brought in his mother-in-law uh, three days after she'd just had uh, a laparoscopy, or no, she had her gallbladder removed, but through scopes. And he was, so I was like, okay, three days ago, should we really be doing this anyway? So we started, let him start, thinking, okay, we'll see where he's going with this. And then once he started putting his hands around the scar site, trying to delve in, I was like, okay, I think we need to stop that right there, and we had to terminate the exam. We just had to stop it, because it was like, oh my gosh, this is going <laughs> to... Um, so we don't do that. <laughs> we don't do that. But we do need to be prepared to intervene at a relatively early stage. Perhaps three days might be a bit soon, but even in those cases, we can still work very functionally. But he was literally kind of going, in, and I was like, what? <laughs> it's quite scary. Um, so, he, needless to say, he didn't pass that exam. Um, uh, so, any other causes? Of, so, yes, so surgery is by far and away the most common. So, any time someone presents uh, having had a laparoscopy or they've had uh, any kind of abdominal surgery, so appendectomy is another big, big, you know, so common. It's why we have to know about whether they've had an appendectomy, it can have a huge influence on uh, fertility. Uh, and uh, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a leading cause of secondary infertility uh, surgery. So you know, it has huge, it has mechanical implications for it. So we definitely need to ask in our history. Yes. C-section. C-sections. Yes, absolutely. Yes, they have that potential. Yes. Yes. So surgery of any kind uh, and endometriosis are the main ones. Obviously, infection perforations, only thing that introduces blood into the abdomen. Okay, so we're going to look quickly at the fascial organisation. I borrowed one of Richard's. Uh, Richard Twine, he came and spoke here, obviously, a year or two ago. I can't remember, maybe not a little bit. This is one of his pictures, just to show generally the organisation in a very general term of uh, the fascial bags that exist uh, in the thorax and in the abdomen. It's not quite accurate, it's not bad. Um, so we have our diaphragm here. It doesn't really run right down like this. It runs down and kind of goes across here because we have the pelvic contents sitting just below. Uh, I've shown this picture just to show here what we're looking at, just to orientate ourselves. We're looking for above, down into a pelvis. This is the pubis sacrum's at the back there. So this is the bladder. 
so here is the uterus. So what are these structures here? What's this here and here? Anyone have a hazard guess? Broad ligaments. Uh, broad ligaments. Well, anything else? Anyone? Any other takers? Round ligaments. It's round ligaments. Yeah, it's the round ligaments. So the round ligaments, this structure here comes out, runs down, over the pubis and into the labia. So it's a really important, uh, uh, it's rather like a, uh, during pregnancy, particularly the round ligaments is like a guy rope on the, uh, uh, the uterus. It really helps guide that movement. So often once the uterus is starting to grow and you'll see patients who then complain of, oh, I've got this real pain in the side, you know, a, a stitch-like or a deep, sharp pain. Uh, sort of in those first 20 weeks or so of pregnancy where the baby's really starting to grow and later, it's often the round ligament that is implicated in there. So it's going to be uh, tight. So you can check for that around the inguinal, the medial end of the inguinal ligament. You can apply pressure over the pubis. Uh, and obviously mechanics can cause pain there, but also the fact that you've got the insertion of the round ligaments there will, uh, can be a, another possible source of pain. So what we're looking at here is in fact, Back. is actually folds of peritoneum. See, what we've done with fascia in the past is we've called it lots of different names. We've, you know, each area has got its own name. And it's really confusing because as osteopaths, we're not interested in individual bits, we're interested in how things are connected. So here, we can see this is global structure, and you can imagine when you understand that there's this unbroken bag, that if you have a problem here, like a scar in the abdomen, or you have tension in the diaphragm, well, that can have an effect indirectly on what's happening in the peritoneum lower down here. So then we get to our picture here, and we see that this is all peritoneum. All of this is peritoneum. But we call it the broad ligament, and then we have a little, uh, 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 we have another name for the space between the uterus and the bladder. We have another name for the space between the uterus and the rectum, uh, and then we give different names to the way that it drapes over the fallopian tubes. And so it's, it's, it's just peritoneum, but we call it the broad ligament. But it's peritoneum. So it's peritoneal folds. And it makes it much easier to picture that effectively the peritoneum comes down, then sits on top of the bladder, folds in, comes around, and, and so um, Many of you may have seen the, 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 the Renzo or Claudia both do the, uh, and I've done it where we imagine someone's a sacrum, someone's a pubis, and you have someone being a rectum, someone being a uterus, someone being a bladder, and you drape a blanket over them. So if you imagine, Ian, and I am a uterus, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> peritoneum, okay, and then my hands out here. They are the uh, fallopian tubes, okay? So I would be flexed forwards. My fallopian tubes are out to the side here, and you can see at the side that in fact we have two layers here. And that's what you have. You have two layers of peritoneum that help form effectively another ligament. But I, I don't want us to think of the name of that ligament because it's just not helpful. It's all just peritoneum. So uterus folds forward. This would then fold over the bladder, if we're going anteriorly, so anterior is in front of me, so, and then you get this little fold that forms between the bladder and the front of the uterus, there we go here, so you get this fold here. So, it's really useful just to be able to realise that that's where, that's why we have four layers of membrane between the floating tubes on the anterior and posterior surfaces, so you have four layers, because it's simply draped uh, a, a peritoneum. So, you then begin to imagine, if you then have any kind of cut into the abdomen, any kind of cut, that's going to create scarring in the peritoneum that has potential to affect mobility of the uterus. Yeah, so everything's connected to everything and it's really important that we understand that. Um, one of the things we're gonna look at later is there are three little ligaments here. This is the, uh, oh, you, uh, come on, one of my students help me, my brain's gone. It's one that we do the test here when we lift up. Yeah, pubis. Uh, no, uh, no, 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 the other one. The one that goes when you're sitting and you test and you lift here. Pubis. Medium, medium, medium umbilical ligaments. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot there. I, I should have remembered. I couldn't, couldn't remember. Medium umbilical ligaments. 
So this is the median umbilical, and then these are the medial umbilical ligaments. And they're important because they uh, uh, have a role in the tension that develops in the bladder. Okay, <coughs> so if we can see again, another one of Richard's pictures. <coughs> so we see the peritoneum coming down, and it sits on top of the uh, organs here. Okay, and what we can also see is that the other folds in peritoneum fold around uh, the transverse colon and uh, the roots of the mesentery and the sigmoid colon. They are all simply, you see it's a continuous structure where it comes in, folds around uh, the uh, small intestine and then hangs off this root at the back here. We make use of these a lot, so they're really important to have that visual. Rather than think of meso, transverse mesocolon and roots of the mesentery, they're all these separate words, which are actually the same thing. They're just folds of peritoneum, uh, and, 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 uh, and it makes it much simpler. So we have stuff that sits within the peritoneum, and then we have stuff behind the peritoneum. And so retroperitoneally, we have the kidneys are probably the most important structure that we need to test for. And, and effectively, the pelvic organs are retroperitoneal. Uh, because they sit behind it, or behind a layer of it. Uh, so looking again, we can see there are these, these, what we had in this cross section, we can now see from the front, so these are where these folds of peritoneum are. So the transverse mesocolon hangs off here. So the transverse colon can come all the way down here, so we can't really find that, but we can find where its root is, because that's very consistent, and we can test that structure. The root of the mesentery effectively runs from the ASIS over the umbilicus. So all of the small intestine moves around that axis. So it's really important. If we can just imagine, you know, of course they fill the whole abdomen, but they all move effectively around this root. And as we'll look at another slide later, we'll see there's masses of blood vessels which pass through here. Really, really important. So if we want to influence fluid flow within the abdomen, We've got to make these mesentries move because if there's stasis there, you're not going to get good blood flow. Uh, so we test each of these three uh, uh, junctions or uh, areas of uh, um, fascia, effectively. Okay. So that's really saying the same thing, uh, except it just shows. Yeah, again, you can see different. Uh, here, here they're calling it the broad ligament, and the round ligament here. Um, uh, yeah, there's nothing else we need to talk about. I'm conscious of time. Okay, so this is looking at the pelvic floor, and I talked about the perineum, where we need to assess the perineum. Perineal body sits right here. So how do I examine that area? What I say to my patients is, uh, can you find the uh, back part of your vagina, between the skin between your vagina and your anus. And I say, can you just point to that area? And they will find it, and I'll say, okay, is it okay if I just place my fingers now over the top of your fingers, you take your fingers away, and we can test the pelvic floor there now. And it's really easy, and you can then feel the density of the perineal body. And the reason why the perineal body is so important is that all of this blue is uh, fascia. So here's the perineal body, and it has connections with the deep and superficial fascial layers. It's like a central point around which all of the other areas coalesce. So it's a really important thing to be able to address because it has connections with the fascia that goes directly around the uterus and vagina, around the rectum, around the bladder and ure uh, uh, urethra. All of those are gonna be influenced by tension around uh, this, uh, this little uh, body. It's very simple to check and doesn't feel anything like as invasive to have it examined as you might think. For chaps, if you are going to examine that area, usually what I say to my male patients, because the other group that we sort of don't include in this, and it's a real epidemic problem, is chronic prostatitis. Non-bacterial prostatitis. It's a huge problem uh, that is probably talked about even less than women's health issues, because it's men, and we're crap at that sort of thing, and talking about this, but you know, it's not great. Uh, they have pain when they urinate, they may have testicular pain, perineal pain, penile pain, they may have pain when they ejaculate, kind of takes the edge off things, you know, so it's not, it's not a great thing to have, and guys don't, you know, they don't know what to do about it, and we may have something to offer, just, and, and part of that will be assessing this same point. So, for men, I just give the instructions, say, can you just cup 
around your uh, nether region, so I'm not pressing there, I'm just going to press on the skin just behind your testicles, and I'm just going to press on there, and then they will just hold, and you know, if they're in pain, frankly, they don't care, they, 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 there's no worries about it, they are usually desperate, because it's a really miserable condition. And you can work to release, begin to release this area, the pelvic floor there. Uh, and, and we can talk about that later once we get into the treatment principles. Okay, just another slide looking again at the fascial organization, just to show, you know, you can sometimes hear people who talk about visceral osteopathy and they speak with certainty that you come on this landmark and this area and you can feel the ascending colon or the descending colon. But do bear in mind that when you are doing that, you are passing through skin, adipose tissue, and one, two, three, four layers of muscle before you then get to the fascia overlying the uh, ascending colon. So uh, any time anyone is certain about what they're on, they're being slightly less than honest because we can never be certain. We can have a pretty good idea, but uh, it's often guesswork. And one of the great frustrations of visceral work is, well, I don't know what I'm on, and that's okay. <laughs> because you can still feel dysfunctional tissue and you can release it. And you can have an idea of what you're releasing. And when you look at the screen that we have, it's very simple. And it does address each of these structures and at least give us an idea about what we may be on and what we're feeling. And uh, so here is a search of how he's put together this nice little sort of pictogram just showing all of the links between different structures. And we can see how you know, the fascia of the pelvic floor is linked to the pericardium, the endothoracic fascia, and the pleura. So we can't miss out the thorax. We have to look at the thorax as well. So that makes it all sound like, well, how the hell are we going to have time to do this in half an hour? You know, when, when are we actually going to do this? I, I promise you, it's, it can be done a lot more quickly. Okay, so what are the... What are the so that's the fascial organisation of the pelvis. What about this sort of pressure distribution and circulation? Uh, this is one of Renzo's pictures to show nicely this idea that there are varying pressures through the uh, uh, different cavities. That we have the cranial cavity, thoracic cavity, abdominal cavity, which is divided into three here, or the pelvic cavity here. And each one of those will have different levels of pressure within them, and if we don't get this nice pressure gradient, then we get dysfunction. Uh, and so we need to, uh, if the diaphragm isn't functioning well, or if we have tension, in the uh, thoracic uh, cavity, that's going to have implications for the abdominal cavity. So it's just remembering that there are these links because we are wanting fluid to move through. But if we have resistance here, then we're not going to be able to get a good return of, of fluid. And bearing in mind that the venous system and the um, lymph system operate under low pressure, they are not going to, it's not going to have an awful lot to impair their return into general circulation. So we do need to bear that in mind. There's a nice picture here from Alain Corbier. I mean, I'm happy to share most of these slides with you. There's one or two I can't render those pictures, but the others I can um, share with you. Um, so here he actually lists the different pressures there are. I think doesn't come out on the slide very well. And here again, you can see those structures again inside. You know, bear in mind, all that pressure is going to come down on onto the pelvis, or the contents of the pelvis, uh, and that potentially can be problematic. But we'll see, we've got a, a very clever way of getting around that. So, just so that we're clear, we can picture what goes on with breathing when we're inhaled and exhaled, what happens and what happens to the pelvic diaphragm during inhalation and exhalation. Very simple, I don't need to cover that too much, but you'd be amazed how many people can't do this correctly, which is to dome their abdomen during in-breathing. You know, you, we've all seen it, that they all breathe in through their chest, and that is massively problematic. Uh, I remember treating clinic just to uh, a woman who had very profoundly uh, uh, disrupted pe pelvic floor. It was very, very tight, and it was affecting her hip. And all we got her to do, no real treatment other than just a guide with my fingers just on the pelvic floor, and tried to get her to do this abdominal breathing, and she really couldn't do it, so it was all in her chest. I said, no, no, that's changed. And we got her to breathe into her abs and managed to give her the right cues so she could do that. As soon as she did it, all that tension in the pelvic floor melted immediately, and her hip went into full external rotation, whereas it was, it was stuck about here, and it went dropped right out into full external rotation, just within 30 seconds of her breathing properly. Just being able to get it to hold was quite another thing, but that you could see immediate results. So it's really important that this action happens. You know, we, we, we all know it, but how often are we in our busy clinical lives really thinking about the effect of the diaphragm and how much of a change it can make? I love listening to Richard Twining talk and he, and he 
he says when he first started out in practice, he just didn't get on well with the whole biomechanical model. He said, oh, I found it difficult to adjust, found it difficult to do all these other things. And so um, all he started out doing was diaphragm techniques and liver releases. He said, that's all I did to start with, and I started seeing patients get better. And he teaches you know, the visceral course at the ESO now, and he has nine techniques for the diaphragm. Uh, and uh, all the ones that he learned early on. And, and, and so we can just do that. You know, it's, why does it work? Well, in my view, I think because it's having this venous and lymphatic effect, uh, which is kind of what's in our basic principles that Stuart was talking about. So how is it that all of this pressure, which is coming from above, doesn't end up just causing massive prolapse? Well, of course it does in some cases. I'm nearly there. I will finish it for so we have a nice break. Uh, well, this is another one of Rainbow's pictures. We can see all of the pressure ultimately, because of the tilt of the pelvis, moves anteriorly and is taken on the uh, pelvic bowl. So it goes onto the pubis and on the bony structure and then down into the lower extremity. So you effectively think that the pelvis uh, is, 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 as long as it is in its good orientation, i.e. pubis in line with the ASISs, then most of that downward pressure should go onto osseous structure and not onto the pelvic contents. As soon as someone loses that lumbar lordosis from sitting all the time and they kind of sat back and their pelvis is posteriorly rotated, suddenly every time they cough, sneeze, that's going to go down. Instead of going onto the pelvic rim, it's going to go onto the soft tissues potentially. And that's not really what it's designed for. So we have this lovely organization of being able to, you know, if these curves are working well, um, of, of redistributing this pressure gradient. So the idea is to keep it off the pelvic floor. Uh, then we can also look at this mechanism of the, the pelvis that uh, during normal ambulation it has this twofold movement of, of, uh, on, the, on the slide on your right there. Uh, we have this opening and closing effect of the pelvis during breathing and during forward and backward movement. We're going to see this open and close effect. That has a massive pumping effect. But if these sacral reacts are not working well, the psoas is tight, the piriformis is tight, you're not going to get that same action happening. You're going to get decreased pumping effect. So that's number one. That's number one sort of breathing effect of the pelvis. And the other one is looking at this uh, the pelvis in cross section. So we've got the humeral uh, humeral heads, uh, the femoral heads sitting here. Uh, okay, and it's this idea that the pelvis also moves around the central axis of the acetabula. So you're going to get this slight in out movement as well and we do that from squatting to standing and it has a, that, that role and if you don't have good hip movement you're going to disrupt this pressure distribution system uh, and this sort of basic breathing mechanism of the, uh, of, of, of the pelvis. Yeah, I can talk about that more but we don't have time so let me just give you a quick idea of the uh, blood supply to these areas so uh, uterine and ovarian blood supply uh, you've got uh, blood supply directly coming off the iliacs into the uh, pelvis, and this, this blood supply will also go along the fallopian tubes to the uterus, but the uterus also has its own separate supply that comes via this, uh, uh, this bundle where you've got a little artery and vein coming off the vena cava and off the aorta. So you've got two supplies to the ovary. So you've got the one coming uh, centrally, and then you've got the one coming peripherally down. And therefore, this is going to have a mechanical effect, potentially. So it's just important that we try and understand the, you know, just these, acknowledge the fact that these uh, systems are there and that we, uh, so this is showing the ovarian supply where it's branching off the aorta here. Okay. Neural organization, I will be quick. Okay, so this is just showing us levels at which these uh, meter trees are again. Uh, and also the nerve supply will be localized to that level because it's part of the uh, um, peritoneum and so therefore that is dermatomal in its nerve supply. So it's useful that when we're working on these areas, we are having a reflex effect at those levels. So when someone presents with an L3 restriction, it may well be that there's a problem at the roots of the mesentery which needs addressing. Uh, and I'll show you how to differentiate between those two. And you end up treating that as you release it, suddenly the L3 restriction goes away. And that's that neural effect that we're talking about. And that's why that now also may be a direct mechanical effect as well. Uh, and this is 
another picture really just to show again the number of vessels that are in these knees and troops. So it's the same thing, we're showing posterior abdominal wall, so we can still see ascending and descending colon, ascending and descending colon. They are retroperitoneal, they sit officially behind the peritoneum. And so then we can see roots of the mesentery tree here, and we see all of the blood vessels here. And this is only a schematic, but still, it's, it's even more in real life. So it, it, they're really, really important for fluid movement in the body and how these uh, uh, mesentery trees function. Another source of great pain or chronic pelvic pain is the pudendal nerve. And so we need to know about it, and we need to know approximately where it is. S234, and it passes around the sacrospinous ligament. So when you do do internal work, one of the key landmarks you look for are the ischial spines. And they are really easy to feel. They are at about seven o'clock and about five o'clock on each side. And uh, uh, that is where the pudendal nerve is going to sit. So you can then run it along this area. I know of women who have had surgery to release, you know, the surgeon's gone in and cut along here because they think that there is, you know, there's pudendal neuritis and they're trying to release pressure from there. Just imagine that for a minute. Where that is, would you want a surgeon going in and cut? But that is kind of what's on offer for pudendal neuritis uh, as an approach. I think I'd rather have the trick points that may be associated with this muscle uh, treated first before attempting surgery. Unfortunately, these cases tend to come in after surgery. <laughs> Saying, okay, I've tried surgery, that didn't work. What can you do for me? Imagine how much harder it is once it's scouring and all of the other things to try and release this nerve. Now, the pudendal nerve is used medically um, because it uh, supplies all of the pelvic floor. So that's useful during delivery. So we can see how they locate the pudendal nerve. They can either do it externally, they inject into it, or they do it internally through this sheet here and then the needle is just uh, exposed right at the end and they either sometimes inject directly into the sacrospinous ligament because they know that they're gonna then, uh, it's gonna flood the area and, and, and affect the pudendal nerve. Uh, so it is an important nerve, um, but it's a real uh, source of chronic pain in the pelvic floor. Uh, and we can affect that just by working on the sacred tuberous and sacrospinous ligaments some very simple ways. You already know how to affect those structures, but it's bearing it in mind how to, how to get to the pudendal nerve. We can get to it externally quite easily. So here we can see, again, it, uh, it has branches of the anus, the perineum, external urethra, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the clitoris, although it doesn't supply all of those to the uh, clitoris. Okay, so comparison between male and female urethra. There's a little difference in uh, length, although actually they're very similar in terms of where the external sphincter sits. You know, the difference being that for men, they've got the prostate gland between. So uh, that, that adds a little bit of extra support. So the female urethra is just three to four centimeters long. It has two uh, um, sphincters, an internal one and an external one. The external one is the only one that's under voluntary control. The internal one is under sympathetic nerve control. So most of the time, sympathetic is firing, causing the muscle at the base here to relax and causing this to contract. Then once the stretch receptors get to the point where it's like, okay, time for you to, I'm not liking the stretching anymore, I want to evacuate, the sympathetics are inhibited. So the internal uh, 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 sphincter is released, this is contracted, and, uh, and so it's working against you. That then also means your detrusor muscle, which is the main muscle around the bag of the bladder, will then start to contract. So when you feel like you need to go, and it's like, but I really need to go, it's because actually you do, because your bladder is now contracting against you, and the only thing that's stopping it from losing control is your external urethral sphincter. So that's what you use to control it, both in men and women. Now, if you've had that damage through childbirth, then that can be a bit of a problem. Or if you cannot contract these muscles that support the urethra, which is what we were talking about with the Kegel exercises, then that's going to be a problem. Having said that, obviously the trigger points are very important and we need to be able to address all of that and, and work with that. But nevertheless, we do need to be able to contract this. And that's the only bit. So the rest of your body, once the body decides it needs to evacuate the bladder, it's working against you. And, uh, and you really only have a certain amount of time before um, you know, this will give out. So, so 
you know, it, the body really is working against you. It's not just that you need to go. Once you've decided that, then actually it's starting to actively contract against you. So it's a real bugger. It's not really very nice. Um, but it's uh, quite a clever system. So that's just showing the pictures of much the same thing. Uh, this is quite a nice, you know, just a nice sort of pencil drawing. I don't know why I put it in there. Okay, one of the other things that is involved in the urethra, this is a cross section of the urethra, is that we have this spongy coat and then we have the intermediate coat, and we have this spongy sort of layer here. And this is an awful lot that determines the patency of your closure mechanism. If that is dried out, then you're going to lose the tube, is no longer as easy to close off. So you may still be able to make the same contraction externally, but if this is all, instead of being nice and uh, flush and puffy, but instead it's, it's kind of dried out and not, uh, not uh, uh, um, pliable, it doesn't matter how good your contractions are on the outside, you're still going to have a little bit of space in the middle and it's not going to be effective. So those simple things of just, we're, we're the reason we want good blood supply is that we get nice healthy tissue, and so it's, it's not just about the muscle. It isn't just about the muscle. It is about the circulation because otherwise we haven't got anything to, to push against. Those muscles have got nothing to, to, to work against. That makes sense. So we lose that uh, patency there. Uh, is there anything more I need to really say about that? No, not really. That's just a nice picture. And we are about one minute away. So it's really looking at some of the ligaments that join, also the urethral ligaments, the pubo-urethral ligament. They're very important in terms of support and you can palpate those. So when you're working internally and you push on that posterior surface, you're going to feel the, uh, the pubis, and you just feel it's a very short structure, the, uh, the, the urethra. And when it's healthy, it has a very distinct feel about it. You'll recognize it's healthy already from the work you do on any soft tissue. When it's not healthy, it will feel nodular. It will have a hard, a, a, and it, won't, it just won't feel healthy. It, it, you, you know what healthy tissue feels like and what unhealthy tissue feels like. And so you treat it in just the same way. It's obviously a bit tender, but you can still work along that. Or you can teach your patients to do the same. Even if they, you don't want to do the work, you can teach them how to massage and work on this region so that that's going to improve the patency of the spongy layer and to mobilize the uh, urethra so that there, there is some chance that uh, it's, it's, it's going to function better. This is a nice picture from Baral in a male model but showing this, the, the way that this external, uh, uh, external uh, uh, aura sphincter is actually made up of the pubovesical muscle and uh, coccygeus, uh, rectovesical muscle as well. So they kind of come around it. I love that picture of where they're sort of opposing one another. It's very clever, it's very elegant. But the real life is really like that, so I don't know, but it looks nice. And so I'd like to have that picture in my head. And then uh, we can see the uterus sacral ligaments here as well. They're really important. Uh, and, and really, the way to think about them is that they form part of the support structure for the cervix. And they're really strong um, ligaments, or should be, but they can get torn during delivery, and that's what can lead to ptosis and drop of the cervix. It's one of the reasons why we can get um, uh, 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 ptosis. So if we just go back to this final picture, I am. Oh, where are we? Uh, no, next one. What this can help us is that when we get uh, prolapse, we see nicely here that the uterus is sitting all nice and high in a perfect position. Uh, when it comes down, so that the cervix is sitting here, so about one centimeter above the introitus there, uh, that would be considered a grade one prolapse. Once it's becoming external, then it's grade two, and it can come completely out to grade three and four. So it, it can actually become outside the body, fully outside the body, in the worst cases of prolapse. So we can see a lot of grade one and two cases, uh, and uh, you know, obviously surgery was the go-to, but now all of the problems with mesh and so on, uh, and all the complications that are arising around that, that may not be uh, an option that so many women are going to um, go to. So the question is, can we need to intervene earlier? Because it's quite difficult to intervene once the prolapse has happened. You can't make that change, but it's interesting, you can still change the function quite often. Even though nothing will change in terms of a scan, it looks the same before and after, but even when you treat these areas, you can still see 
uh, change in function. And obviously women are going to be grateful for any improvement that they can get. Um, and that's really probably all I'm going to say at this stage. I think. So in this last picture we can just see the pelvic, the, the base rain eye, uh, and its relationship to obturator internus, and one of the few direct connections of a muscle joint to another muscle, true muscle chain where this is the arcus tendineus. This is another thing you can palpate internally, but this is a, this whole of eye is so important in terms of its supportive structure for both the bladder and for the uterus, the cervix, and um, the rectum. So that's, I've sort of done that really quickly, but I just hope you get that picture of what it is that we're trying to look at and examine. And what we're gonna look at afterwards is how to examine all this quite quickly. So I'll show you the examination. It'll take about, uh, I don't know, five minutes, I suppose, we can do it in, 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 as, as a general quick screen, and then um, and you're going to practice this. Number one, you're just going to put your hands lightly on the uh, shoulders here, and there's really nothing sophisticated about this. All I am trying to assess here is what are the qualities of the tissues? Not just trapezius, but think of all of the scalenes, platysma, all of those muscles that then... Because uh, uh, you want to look at the quality. So it's just a very light, do these tissues give a little bit here? Or are they tighter one side more than the other? If they are, then you already know there is definitely going to be lymphatic compromise and venous compromise. You know that. So that's your first thing. You put your hands on, it's just a quick decision, how does that feel? That's it. That's all you need to do. So that's all I'm talking about here. Yes, you can look at first rib, and yes, you can make it more complicated, but the initial assessment is, does that feel boggy and edematous, or is it healthy and feel like good healthy tissue? And I don't have to teach you what that feels like, you know what that feels like. So it's that, that's the first thing. Then we do the spinal density palpation. So I get all of my students in the women's health thing, we just do this, literally that's their, they love it, because they haven't got to fill out all these pointless forms that no one ever looks at anyway. I don't know if you do, do any of you use those in clinic? You know, you know, they've got the circle and how far flex and all this. <laughs> I mean, I never look. I mean, as a tutor, I never look. I'm just like, well, I don't really know what that means. So, you know, let's just move on and just do something else that's useful. So we just, I mean, yes, they have to do the CCA stuff and they have to demonstrate. But honestly, I think you could do that using a lot of this basic spinal diagnosis. You can go, okay, so she has a problem here. She has a problem here. And she has a little problem here in cervical. So then I can decide which of those has the greatest density. And I would say, in terms of congestion, it's that lower lumbar area, and she maybe has a little scar and rather issue that's going on there. So that's a big problem for her. Straight away, I can feel that hardness or density. So that's that's a spinal density test. And then the next is cavity pressures. So that's where we test the head. Then we test the upper uh, thorax. So this is completely my routine, I'm afraid. So you know, you can. It, it's not fixed in stone, it's just what I've done as a compromise to try and show something as a routine. So this is what we do. So we compress the upper thorax, again we're looking at rib resilience because again the ribs are so important in terms of this general venous return into the body. And then we do the lower thorax, so I just compress and I look and see she has a difference on the right side, it's quite dense and hard. As soon as I try and compress, she really resists. And then if I turn around just a little bit, so okay. So then I'm gonna come over the abdomen. So I do have a posterior contact, always I'm always pushing into a posterior contact. So then I do upper upper abdomen, I come down over the umbilicus, and I just again apply a light pressure and then suprapubically. And we have a lot of density here. Okay, so we can just feel that there's Real, and I can feel that and I compare that to the spinal density and I push one against the other and see her spine softens when I put pressure on here. So the two areas of most density for her were lower abdomen and lower lumbar. So as I palpate, I've got a sense of the quality of that. And so then I can just engage with this. And as I engage, I feel the lumbar soften and this still remains dense. So that tells me out of the two, this is the more primary out of the two. Because when I address that, the lumbers get better, but this still remains tight. So these are this principle of relieving tests. So you find something obvious. So you could take something like an SLR test, or limited external rotation, or piriformis test. Something clear and visual that you can see. And then you see how far it will go under normal circumstance. Test apply a palpatory pressure over the area that you think was dense, repeat the test, 
If it gets better, then you know you found your primary problem because either the SLR or piriformis or external rotation of the shoulder all gets better because everything's revolving around that area of tension. So all you're looking for is this density. You're trying to get a sense of density. So and remember, this is a screen. So I, I've only got half an hour and I've got to decide very quickly. So I'm just going here, 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 here. Test through the abdomen. Okay, quick test through there. Okay, test one against the other, done. Then we move on to supine, and that's it. <laughs> Not a surprise. So we look, uh, first of all, so the sitting screen, the first thing we're going to test is a diaphragm in sitting. So the way I test the diaphragm, it's not sophisticated. I find the lower costal margin. I fold the ulnar edge of my hands. So I start palpating that. Uh, I find that lower margin and I fold my hands underneath the costal margin. So there's enough space for me to be able to come underneath and go posteriorly. So then I can just gently push up on either side. So I can test the liver and diaphragm on one side and we're going to test the diaphragm on the other side and the stomach. Okay, so that's just our diaphragm. I'm just looking for this same density. It's all I'm looking for. So in her case, I feel there's a little problem here uh, on the left-hand side. So now I can test the stomach. So I can get, test the gastrosplenic ligament. So remember the spleen is at the back. The stomach articulates directly with it. So I'm just going to pull. And she has a little restriction there. Wouldn't like that. So there's a little gastrosplenic restriction. So then I come around the other side and we uh, will test it against the liver. So I come underneath, fix the liver, and then move the stomach against the liver. Marsh doesn't like that much. It's got much more give than it does on the gastrospinic side. So I already know I've got some information that her stomach is restricted against the spleen. That's one of the key articulations that we have there. So those are the gastric attachments. So diaphragm, gastric attachments, and liver, which we've just done. There is a much more sophisticated way of doing the liver, but I, I can't remember. So I only do the simple way. So that's that's number one. Okay, now we're going to look for the transverse mesocolon. So remember, this is not the colon itself because that can be anywhere and it's really difficult to localize. But we do know where the where it attaches, which is going to be halfway between the ziphy sternum and the umbilicus. So we sit tall. I find the ziphy sternum. I find the umbilicus. I then palpate, and I find there's a line of weakness along the abdomen there. That is where I let my fingers dive in, so I just relax, slump against me, and then I just go posteriorly until they really won't go too much further. I don't press too hard because I'm also at the level of the pancreas, so the pancreas is friable, we don't want to press too hard on there. So it's just enough that you can go in and then you can lift one side and we lift the other. So on the left side, which was tight from the stomach, but actually it's fine on the transverse mesocolon. On the right, it's probably a little bit uncomfortable there, but it's not too bad. It's okay. It's a little bit of density, but it doesn't feel anything like what we've found so far. So that's transverse uh, mesocolon. You, and then the next, uh, I would then test the, this is what I couldn't remember before, median and medial umbilical ligaments. These are the ligaments that, remember on the picture, those three different ligaments that run up from the bladder up towards the umbilicus. So we come in suprapubically, and we just take a contact, uh, just a central contact, first of all. And then I just lift, and I ask her if that gives her any sensation in the bladder, if there's any discomfort there, that's actually okay. So the median ligament, the one in the middle, you just lift by, you just test by lifting, pure uh, superior movement. If you want to test the uh, medial ligaments, the two on either side, you maintain that same contact and introduce rotation. And so you're just testing to see, is there resistance on rotation, which there is on the left. So her left medial ligament is a little bit tight there. Uh, and that's, that's that way of being able to differentiate very quickly. Okay, so again, bear in mind, these are all quite quick. We're just gonna come in underneath here, here. Uh, so I'm, the fact that I'm talking about it makes it last about 10 times longer than we're actually gonna do it in reality. <laughs> then we can just come down to the pelvic bowl. So the pelvic bowl, we find the ASISs, and then I bring my fingers, the ulnar edge of my fingers, just medial to the ASISs, and then I can feel the pubis inferiorly, and then I'm just gonna try and go bring my fingers posterior to the pubis. Uh, so I'm just sliding in behind, coming down the edge of the iliac uh, blades. So I'm down into the pelvis, and I try and get down just behind the pubis there, and then I translate. So she goes okay that way, there's a bit of density, but I go that side, not so happy. 
quite, quite tight. So I know already that on the right-hand side of our uterus or bladder, there's a bit of restriction on that side. So we have a few things we've picked up. And each one of these things, you're thinking, okay, I'd make a quick note. I mean, clinic, it's really nice. When I do this clinic and I'm doing the examination, because I have someone describing for you, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's so quick. You can just say, can you write this down? And you get this whole list of findings at the end. So that's the uh, sitting screen. The only other thing with this is the coccyx. So if you just turn and please. So the coccyx is really very simple again. It's using the same uh, style of screen, just slump forwards. I'm just going to palpate the end of your coccyx, so that's okay. You take your uh, middle finger, palpate along the length of the coccyx until you feel the uh, terminal end of it. Uh, you can feel, you can almost hook around it. So the first thing is you just don't bring the patient upright. So you have the middle in the, uh, finger in the middle, and then you have two fingers lying inside of it. And you just push superiorly. And then you ask the question, does that hurt? No. The chance are she doesn't have a significance. If, if, if you have a coccyx problem, that will hurt almost straight away. And then I can just test just by leaning her from side to side, and that will very quickly tell me she will have discomfort. Uh, but it is really important not to forget the coccyx because it's, it's like the conductor of the pelvic floor. Everything comes in to that area. So if, it, if it's really fixed, you can try and work on bladder problems, and if the coccyx is really fixed, then you're not going to get uh, good resolution. So it's always worth just checking it. And again, it's using that same density palpation. Okay? So, how are we doing time wise? Because I'm conscious of that. Okay, let's just do the supine one, and then, and then you can practice it. Okay? Alright, so the supine routine. Again, let me just move it on just so I can be sure I don't forget anything. Is in contact with it, supposedly. Okay. Okay, but well, I'll just do it. <laughs> you can see it. So the supine routine, uh, you've got various structures you need to test. Number one, um, you can test the diaphragm again. And I just test the diaphragm and liver and stomach just by taking a contact over the lower thorax and just side shifting. It's nothing more complicated than that. I'm just looking to see, is it dense? And then I rotate here as well. So I do side shift laterally, and then I do a rotation. And that, I'm looking for the quality of the tissue very quickly. I can come underneath in the more traditional way of assessing the diaphragm, but often that's uncomfortable for patients. So you can do this, and you can very quickly pick up if there's a difference from one side to the other, and you can then use that as a means of treatment. So that's what I do for assessing the diaphragm. Next, I want to then test the kidneys. So the kidneys, one of the easiest ways to get to them is to come off the, it's to find the space between the 12th rib and the top of the iliac crest. And there's a little bit of fascia in there, which I can never remember the name of. It's in Baral's book. He talks about it. I can't for the life of me remember what it is, because uh, it's named after somebody, I think. And that's why I think it's a waste of time learning names like that. If you place your uh, middle finger just in that space, and you're going to lift superiorly. So you don't want to be too medial. You want to be lateral to the... Uh, uh, erector spiny masses uh, and even quadratus lumborum a little bit if you can and you just lift one side and you lift the other and you feel whether there is density whether there's a difference from one side to the other and so on her right kidney there is a little bit of density on that fascia so the kidney is directly in front of that so I know there's a little problem with her right kidney and the kidney will nearly always toes so that's that's the dysfunction it will, it will do because of where it sits its natural dysfunction is to go into ptosis and so um, I'll show you quickly a technique for that. So that's how you test for the kidneys. It's really as simple as that. Then the next structure we test is the transverse meso uh, uh, it's the roots of the mesentery. So ASIS, umbilicus. So you remember that diagonal line that I showed you for the... Uh, so I place thumbs superiorly, fingers inferiorly, just on a nice broad contact. So it's a very simple contact. The key to this is to be firm enough that you're making a reasonable contact, but not so firm that everything reacts back against you. So you have to, you do have to do this with a degree of respect. You can't do this with speed. You just nestle in, wait, and you try and use as broad a contact as you can. So the patient relaxes. Once they do, then just flex the fingers a little bit, and you're going to lift and see how that moves. And then I'm going to push inferiorly. So inferiorly, you can see there's lots of movement. She's quite happy to move in that direction. If I try and move superiorly, I come up against the block almost immediately. So that tells me around this axis, this oblique axis, the small intestine doesn't want to come up at the root of the mesentery. That's just giving me that general impression. And that sits with these kind of patterns that there's an inferior pull down onto the, onto the pelvis there. So that's the root of the mesentery. And then we have 
You remember the sigmoid colon, that's also um, <coughs> uh, uh, got its own little meson tree. So the way to find that, ASIS, and then we have the pubis, okay? And what I do is then just use my fingers, just in a little curl, just around the, uh, sort of around where iliacus would be. You think about where iliacus is, where it lines the uh, iliac, inside iliac crest. You try and curl around that, and that's gonna bring you onto the uh, colon there, yeah, that's all right. Okay, and then you just simply just pull it towards you. So you're just seeing, does it accept that or not? Or is there density response once you do that test? Uh, and then finally, I then will test the uh, bladder and the uh, uterus. So the contact we use with this, is take a nice broad C-shaped contact with index and thumb, either side of rectus abdominis. I flex the hips. And so now what I do is I try and aim with my contacts. I'm going to push posteriorly and inferiorly. So I'm heading toward the uh, tip of the coccyx. So I push down in that direction and that then brings me, oh yeah, that's really tight. Okay, that brings me onto the body of the uterus. And then I can then either use the legs as a lever or I can use my hands directly as a lever to try and side shift and see if there is any resistance. And so those are the main tests. So you can't test the bladder directly, externally. You've got the, you've got the ligament tests, which I showed you. This, because the uterus is so closely associated with the bladder, you can infer and you can treat the bladder very effectively um, with this. So um, the only other test that I then regularly do with everyone is the obturator membrane. And so the way we test the obturator membrane is we place the leg just into a little bit of external rotation. I find the adductor muscles here, uh, and we run along this adductor muscle until you come to bone. So you run your thumb down, you'll come to bone on the pelvis here. Everyone worries they're gonna hit something they shouldn't, but if you follow this basic rule where your thumb is just posterior to the tendon there, so I just push forward, push anteriorly, slide the hand down, I come in contact with bone there. Okay, that's bone. And then I tell my patient, I'm just gonna move laterally. I'm gonna move it away. So there's no panic. You're not going in the wrong direction. And you're going right into the root of the hip. So I turn my thumb so that it's now, instead of facing laterally, I turn it around so that it then faces onto the window of the obturator membrane. Okay, so I'm just on that inferior surface. Now I use my thumb now, I can just trace the bony margin of the inferior obturator membrane. And then I can push into the space and see, does that accept what I do or not? If, if you want to be sure you're in the right space, you just get the patient to push their heel to the ceiling and then relax down. That will contract obturator externus, which sits directly on that membrane. And so you'll feel that contract underneath your thumb. So it allows you to know you're in exactly the right spot. It's also a very good little treatment because it's relaxed almost immediately and now I'm onto the membrane. And then I can treat by pushing either posteriorly, anteriorly, medially, whatever I need, wherever I feel there's tension. Because you imagine this is, a, this is the obturator membrane, that inferior portion of the membrane. Running across the middle of it is a thick tendon. That is the arcus tendineus. That is the insertion of levator ani. So I told you about accessing levator ani. That's how you can get to it, is where you, you find this inferior margin, you come up the membrane a little bit, and you'll come across this tough uh, transverse structure. That is the, uh, that, that's the, the uh, arcus tendineus, which is where it inserts onto the obturator. And so you can have direct access to the um, uh, levator ani in that position. So it's really powerful in terms of treating the bladder. So releasing the obturator on each side is really useful. Uh, all of the tests which I've done, I'll show you just one example of how you can treat, but all of the tests turn into treatment, except the kidney, the kidney is slightly different, but all of the tests, all the other tests turn into treatment. So let's say we were treating on the root of the mesentery tree here, and we decided that it doesn't move superiorly. Okay, so in osteopathy, we only have two techniques. We either have direct or indirect. So I can be mean in her case, and I can go directly. So I can try and make the whole thing move superiorly. Her tissues really don't like that, and she'll not thank me if I were to do that. So instead, what I will do is I'll move the whole thing inferiorly. I move in that direction, and then I then play with movement medially and laterally until the tissues relax completely. 
So I'm not necessarily going to feel a release, I'm just going to hold it in maximum ease. Uh, and so thinking about the neural uh, 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 model, we're altering neural reflexes in the soft tissues, we're also mobilizing, I guess, uh, and we're going to alter circulation dynamics. So all I've done is taken it in a maximum direction where all the tissues relax, and I hold that for about uh, 30 seconds to a minute. It really doesn't have to be any longer than that. So we're now just going to come back to the neutral point, and I'm now just going to try and raise. It's already easier. It's not gone completely, but it's eased enough that I can now begin to work with that directly. And I can then choose again, either I go medially or laterally, to engage where I want to get maximum change in the tissues. So I focus around that density and I make it really specific. So with all techniques, we're using either direct or indirect. And the same with the small intestine, same with the roots of the mesentery, same with the stomach. All of those things, we will either take it in the direction of ease, where everything relaxes, and wait for the change and then we retest it immediately and see whether or not it's altered and when it's altered then you move on and you look and see what else you need to do so the only other one i'll show you is the kidney because that is a different technique so it's just worth seeing so i found on in her case the kidney was a little bit tight on the uh, her right hand side so the easiest technique there are several but this is the easiest one i found find the umbilicus and move laterally until you find the edge of the rectus abdominis so that's your point of entry. So reinforce put one thumb, reinforce it with the other thumb. Can you do it on the other side? Okay, I yep. could do that. I don't get the satisfaction of testing it <laughs> and seeing whether or not it's changed. Right. Right. So we find umbilicus uh, on, the, on the left kidney, it's a little bit higher, but so we'll still take this point. We come across the lateral edge of rectus, one thumb, and then we bring the other thumb. Oh, can I just bring this in the up? It's mainly so I don't have to, I can lean against something, it makes it much more comfortable for me, but also the patient relaxes a lot more. So then I push posteriorly and medially, and then I come up against this lumpy thing, which is the spine. So we will feel that, and therefore we know we're on psoas muscle. So then we turn our thumbs and come up underneath the kidney. So then we know that we're on the inferior edge. So if you imagine the kidney is there, my thumb is sitting on it, uh, and all I'm trying to do is push the kidney up with breathing. So when the patient breathes in, I resist the inferior movement of the kidney. When she breathes out, I follow the kidney up. So that's all the movement is. So she breathes in, I fix my thumbs. When she breathes out, I follow the movement up and I fix again. So when she breathes in again, she breathes in against a fixed point. When she breathes out, I follow it up. So that's it. That's how you treat a kidney. And then you retest and you'll find that what you found was dense before is no longer dense. And uh, it's, it's, it's really quick. It takes a minute and, and it's fixed. And it's, that's the other reason I like this rule is it's quick. So really what I do, I do this global exam, I come up with a little list and then I just go through the, most, the ones that are most dense, I treat and then recheck again and see if it's, if it's changed. And that's it.